Hello everyone, welcome to Lecture 9C, the final lecture for Week 9 of Applied Immunology. We will end this week's lectures that started off with allergy and autoimmunity by now learning about a third category of unwanted immune response, which are those associated with t organ or tissue transplantation. Today we will start by learning about the mechanisms of immune rejection when tissue from a genetically distinct individual or donor is grafted into a recipient. This is called allograft rejection and is based on recognition of something called alloantigens. We will also cover some immunosuppressive medications that are used to prevent allograft rejection. And lastly, we will talk about two kind of interesting cases, which include the um, converse of graft rejection, which is something called graft versus host disease, and the immunosuppressive mechanisms that allow a pregnant woman's immune system to tolerate a fetus during pregnancy, which we call fetal tolerance. Let's start off by looking at the numbers and success rates of various organ and tissue transplants. Transplantation for more common organs has become much more routine in, in uh, recent decades, thanks to improved surgical procedures, the establishment of transplantation centers and national databases that help coordinate the logistics of matching available organs to compatible patients, and lastly, thanks to the advent of powerful immunosuppressive drugs that increase the chances of graft survival. However, there is still room for improvement in terms of preventing graft rejection. This table summarizes data from the most common transplantation surgeries performed in the United States in 2014. We can appreciate that some organ transplants, such as hematopoietic stem cells and kidneys, are much more common than others, like intestine or pancreas. And we can also appreciate that the success of the transplant or the graft survival rates vary amongst organs as well. Viable donor organs are relatively difficult to obtain for a lot of these, but even in the event of a successful transplantation surgery, for many of these organs, there is still a reasonable likelihood of graft rejection within five years of surgery. This highlights the importance of understanding the mechanisms of graft rejection, which can then be used to help direct the development of novel therapies that could be used to improve graft survival. The mechanisms of graft rejection were first characterized in experiments using inbred strains of mice. Remember from our week 6C lecture that inbred mouse strains consist of individuals who are genetically identical or syngeneic to one another. This set of examples on this slide will use two different mouse strains to study transplantation responses. There's mouse strain MHCA in yellow and mouse strain MHCB in blue that we will see on the next slide. The leftmost panel describes an experiment where a piece of skin was surgically removed from one MHCA mouse and then surgically implanted into another MHCA mouse. Since these identical individuals belong to the same syngeneic mouse line and their genetics are exactly the same, this type of transplant is called an autograft. And you can see from this graph on the bottom that these tissue grafts are tolerated with 100% success if you repeat this experiment in a cohort of multiple animals. However, if you harvest a section of skin from a MHCA mouse and transplant it into a genetically distinct MHCB mouse in blue, this is a situation referred to as an allograft. As some quick vocabulary, allogeneic individuals are genetically distinct individuals. In this example, it would be the two different mouse strains. And these express distinct antigens called alloantigens, because protein expression obviously varies from individual to individual. Now in this situation, the allograft initially survives for about a week and a half, but then will be rejected, as you can see in this blue graph in the bottom middle panel that summarizes rejection in a cohort of multiple mice that received allografts. Notably, if you take this cohort of blue MHCB mice and then try to retransplant them with another MHCA graft as shown in the right panel, the second allograft exhibits accelerated rejection, as all of these so-called second set allografts are now rejected within about a week the second time around. The kinetics of both first set and second set rejection give a hint that allograft rejection is most likely mediated by adaptive responses. At this point in the course, we know that priming of adaptive immune responses for the first time takes about 10 days or so, which is the same time frame that it takes to reject allografted tissue in the first transplant. We also know that the reactivation of adaptive responses to antigens that have already successfully instructed T or B cells occurs much more rapidly upon secondary exposure, and this is consistent with the kinetics of tissue rejection following the second allograft experiment in the rightmost panel here.
The primary mechanism of graft rejection was determined using this final experimental setup on the far right, which involved an MHC B mouse in blue that had already rejected an MHC A skin allograft. We can also refer to this mouse as being sensitized to MHC A, since it has undergone adaptive immune priming against MHC A alloantigens. T cells were transferred from this sensitized mouse to an untreated or naive MHC B mouse. This recipient then received an allograft of MHCA skin in yellow, which was subsequently rejected with the same accelerated rejection kinetics that were observed in the MHCA sensitized mouse. This experiment revealed that the transferred T cells were responsible for exerting a memory immune response against alloantigens found in the MHCA graft. You obviously cannot do these types of experiments in humans, but since almost all organ transplants in humans are done between allogeneic donors and recipients, these same underlying mechanisms of T-cell activation by alloantigens play a major role in transplant rejection. This can be mediated by either CD4 or CD8 T-cells, or both of them together, and also note that autoantibodies produced by alloantigen-specific B-cells can also facilitate allograft rejection in something called hyperacute graft rejection, which we will discuss later on in this lecture. The immune response underlying allograft rejection is also referred to as an alloreactive response because it is mounted against a couple of different types of alloantigens. The first is something that we've learned about extensively in this class, which are MHC molecules. So if you remember back to our week three lectures on antigen presentation, we talked about the immense diversity of MHC molecules that can be expressed, and that this is important in order to ensure the ability to present any conceivable pathogen-derived peptide. Because MHC class one is expressed on almost every somatic cell in the body, this means that MHC molecules from one individual are often the most abundant alloantigens in a donated tissue that um, and they're responsible for determining tissue compatibility. For this reason, we refer to MHC molecules as major histocompatibility antigens or tissue compatibility antigens, um, and this is in the context of transplantation. Again, this type of acute allograft rejection based on MHC mismatch is represented by the central column here where the blue MHC B mouse rejects the yellow um, MHCA skin transplant within about 10 days. When this was first discovered, a lot of effort was put into trying to perfectly match HLA haplotypes between organ donors and recipients, with the thought being that removal of the major histocompatibility antigens would eliminate allograft rejection. However, in recent years, clinicians have been able to use strong enough immunosuppressants in transplant recipients that MHC matching has become irrelevant for most organ transplants, except for bone marrow, which we will discuss in a little bit. Alloreactivity can also be mounted in response to non-MHC tissue antigens, and these are called minor histocompatibility antigens. Let's consider this case on the right column, where you take a piece of skin from a yellow MHC A mouse and transplant it into a new orange MHC mouse that has an identical MHC haplotype. However, this orange mouse is still not a perfectly syngeneic mouse line with uh, the yellow MHC A mice. So in this case, the allograft is still rejected, but the kinetics of rejection take much longer. And this rejection is due to the presence of minor histocompatibility antigens, which are usually polymorphic self-peptides that are presented on MHC class one by somatic cells in the tissue graft. For a given protein, a group of individuals can vary in terms of minor polymorphisms and in individual amino acids in that protein. And this contributes to the overall genetic diversity of a population. In the case of a MHC-matched donor and recipient, these polymorphic amino acid residues are the ones that can drive allograft rejection or recognition by the recipient's T cells, and this is what leads to allograft rejection. Therefore, even in the more difficult case of successful MHC matching between organ donor and organ recipient, minor histocompatibility antigens will lead to allograft rejection if the recipient is not treated with immunosuppressive drugs. Considering that minor histocompatibility antigens could be almost infinite when you consider how many different self-peptides could be presented on MHC class 1, it would be virtually impossible to match a donor to a recipient across both major and minor histocompatibility antigens, though an obvious exception to this would be in the case of tissue transplantation between identical twins.
Therefore, the success of organ transplantation primarily relies on the continued usage of immunosuppressive drugs, which inhibit immune alloreactivity towards transplanted tissue. Before we learn more about how these drugs work, let's first look at some of the underlying mechanisms of alloreactivity. We've already introduced the concept that endogenous T-cells in the recipient are responsible for driving graft destruction. This can occur through two mechanisms, the first being something called direct allorecognition. Let's look at uh, this example of direct allorecognition from a schematic in the book, which occurs following transplantation of a human kidney. So all transplanted tissues contain their own resident immune cells that are introduced to the recipient along with the rest of the organ. Importantly, this includes APCs such as dendritic cells that can then drain out of their original organ once it's been transplanted into a recipient. Note that lymphatic drainage is usually disrupted by transplantation surgery, so the drainage of APCs and soluble antigens from donor tissue usually occurs by entering the blood and then draining to the spleen. Once there, the donor APCs presenting donor peptides are thought to activate recipient T cells and prime them in the spleen. Note that the donor DCs typically do not exhibit perfect MHC restriction with the recipient T cells, but there are usually still some T cell clones that can still recognize donor HLA class 1 and 2 as major histocompatibility antigens in this context, and these clones can become activated in response. Once primed, the activated recipient T cells then migrate to the kidney graft, where they can exert effector functions that destroy the transplanted tissue. And this is what actually leads to allograft rejection. These effector functions include direct cytotoxic targeting by cytotoxic CD8 T cells, as well as activation of macrophages by CD4 T cells. Direct allo recognition usually occurs quite quickly and is thought to be responsible for acute tissue rejection. Allograft rejection can also occur through a second mechanism called indirect allo recognition. In comparison to direct allo recognition that is mediated through donor APCs activating recipient T cells, indirect allo recognition occurs when recipient DCs cross present histocompatibility antigens derived from apoptotic donor cells. So, recipient DCs can phagocytose donor antigens, including um, HLA or MHC molecules in addition to uh, potential minor histocompatibility antigens. And then these recipient DCs can obviously present those peptides to alloreactive T cell clones. Similarly to direct allo recognition, this priming usually occurs in the spleen, and then effector T cells can traffic to the grafted tissue to kill it through the same mechanisms that we discussed on the last slide. Both direct and indirect allo recognition lead to the same outcome, which is allograft rejection. Importantly, alloreactive CD4 T cell activation can also facilitate graft rejection by providing T cell help to alloreactive B cells. And these uh, B cells in turn produce allo antibodies that are capable of recognizing the transplanted tissue. The presence of allo antibodies, which usually recognize things like blood antigens or polymorphic uh, MHC antigens, can lead to an extremely rapid form of alloreactivity called hyperacute graft rejection. Since most donated tissues contain at least residual amounts of blood, the presence of mismatched ABO blood antigens that we talked about in week six can serve as the basis of hyperacute graft rejection. This is due to the fact that antibodies against non-self ABO blood antigens can actually uh, bind to tissues other than red blood cells. And this includes the endothelial cells that line the interior of blood vessels that provide circulation to the graft. If this occurs, the bound antibodies can trigger both the complement cascade as well as blood clotting cascades. This leads to the blockage or occlusion of blood vessels that vascularize the tissue graft, and this leads to blood leakage in the organ. The transplanted organ then hemorrhages, and the pooling of deoxygenated blood turns the graft dark purple as the organ very quickly fails. Hyperacute graft rejection can be avoided or prevented in a number of ways, the most obvious being to ensure that there is blood typing compatibility between donor and recipient. Donor and recipient can also be tested for cross-matching, where recipient serum antibodies are screened for their ability to bind to donor leukocytes, which is an indicator of being at high risk of hyperacute graft rejection. Other therapies, such as intravenous aminoglobulins, or IV IGs, can also be used to inactivate anti-blood antigen antibodies in the recipient. 
So fortunately, there are a few ways that hyperacute graft rejection can be screened for and treated in order to improve transplant survival. Now that we understand the ways that allografts can be rejected, we can look at the mechanism of action of several immunosuppressive drugs that are used in transplant recipients. Considering how it's essentially impossible to fully match major and minor histocompatibility antigens between donor and recipient, the use of these drugs is really essential in preventing allograft failure in the majority of organ transplants. At this point, we've established that alloreactive T cells are a major player in mediating graft rejection, both directly through their own cytotoxic functions, indirectly through their um, activation of graft resident macrophages, and also indirectly through providing T cell help to alloreactive B cells in order to produce alloantibodies. So it makes sense that the majority of immunosuppressive drugs center on inhibiting various aspects of T cell activation. We extensively covered the many signal transduction pathways that enable T cell activation in week four. So you might want to check back to lecture 4C if you need a refresher on T cell signaling. These drugs can be broadly categorized as either monoclonal antibodies that inhibit cell surface receptors or other markers that are on the cell surface, and these function by inhibiting the stimulation or initiation of signaling pathways. Um, but there's also another category of drugs that act intracellularly to inhibit steps of T-cell signal transduction. CD52 inhibition with alemtuzumab is usually used to deplete T-cells as well as other host immune cells prior to organ transplantation. And this kind of makes the body more receptive to receiving an organ transplantation. Other monoclonal antibodies like Beltacept and anti-CD3 antibodies um, inhibit the activation of the TCR as well as the CD28 co-stimulatory receptor, while basiliximab blocks a high affinity subunit of the IL-2 receptor. And this is done in order to prevent IL-2 signaling, which is crucial for T-cell proliferation and survival. Drugs that interfere with intracellular signaling components include inhibitors of the cell cycle, which obviously function by blocking T-cell proliferation, while drugs like cyclosporin and tacrolimus um, interfere with calcineurin signaling to prevent activation of the transcription factor NFAT, which we know is a required transcription factor downstream of TCR activation. Another consequence of TCR and IL-2 receptor signaling is activation of mTOR, which is necessary for T-cell differentiation. And this can be blocked by administration of this drug called sirolimus. When used either individually or in combination with one another, these drugs are all powerful immunosuppressives that act by blocking the activation, proliferation, or differentiation of alloreactive effector T cells. These are essential for promoting graft tolerance, and improvements in survival rates of grafted organs can be largely attributed to the efficacy of these drugs. However, broadly suppressing T cells for the remainder of a patient's life post-organ transplant does come with some obvious risks, as these patients are often considered immunocompromised, and so they're much more susceptible to infection. In the last section of today's talk, I want to go over a couple of interesting topics related to transplantation immunology, the first being something called graft versus host disease, or GVHD. We can think of GVHD as being basically the converse of allograft rejection, in that GVHD occurs when donor T cells transferred along with grafted tissue then exit that grafted tissue to go on and recognize alloantigens expressed by the recipient, and therefore these transplanted T cells then attack the recipient's tissue. This occurs most often following hematopoietic stem cell transplants, or HSC transplants, and these include HSCs that have been isolated from the bone marrow, peripheral blood, or cord blood. This is done most often in the treatment of blood cancers called leukemias, as well as some other rare blood disorders where the recipient's defective HSCs need to be replaced by healthy HSCs from a donor. In order to do this, the recipient's HSCs are first killed off by a combination of irradiation and cytotoxic chemotherapies. And these function by clearing out a niche in the bone marrow for the donor HSCs, which should then uh, proliferate and replace the defective endogenous HSCs. GVHD occurs when allogeneic T cells included in the transplanted cells recognize recipient tissue antigens presented by endogenous dendritic cells in secondary lymphoid organs. This results in the priming of donor T cells, which can then migrate to various tissues and kill or damage host cells. 
GVHD can affect many different tissues, but some of the most common clinical presentations include inflammatory responses that are localized to the skin, intestines, and liver. GVHD is particularly aggressive when donor T cells recognize major histocompatibility antigens. So for stem cell transplants, clinicians prioritize matching HLA haplotypes between donor and recipient, much more so than they would for other solid organ transplants. In most patients, GVHD is driven by donor T cell allo recognition of minor histocompatibility antigens that are expressed in recipient tissues. To prevent pathological GVHD, patients that receive stem cell transplants must be treated with immunosuppressive drugs like the ones that we covered on the last slide. Obviously, GVHD is an undesirable effect of HSC transplantation, but it can actually have some benefits, particularly in cancer patients. Because donor T cells can recognize recipient alloantigens, these T cells can also target residual leukemia cells that were not killed off by chemotherapy and irradiation treatments that were used prior to HSC transplantation. In this case, the alloreactive donor T cells actually help the host by targeting and killing off leukemia cells. This phenomenon is called a graft versus leukemia effect or GVL effect. This is why for most HSC transplants, mature T cells present in donor HSC preparations are not simply sorted out or removed from the population of cells that's going to be transferred into the recipient. So despite the risk of GVHD, the benefits of GVL usually justify keeping mature donor T cells in the transplanted cell pr uh, preparation. The last interesting case related to transplantation immunology that we will cover today is something that you may not really think of, at least at first, in the context of tissue transplantation, which is pregnancy. All of the other transplants we've covered so far are a result of modern medical treatments that are aimed at replacing defective or diseased tissue with healthy donor tissue. In pregnancy, however, the developing fetus carried by a pregnant female is considered an immunologically foreign tissue transplant. And this is obviously because a fetus expresses genes from both the mother and the father, including paternal HLA alleles and paternal minor histocompatibility antigens. Despite this histocompatibility mismatch between fetus and mother, in almost all pregnancies, there are no maternal immune responses that are mounted against the fetus, at least T cell responses. Interestingly, the fact that fetal rejection rarely occurs makes the mechanisms of fetal tolerance a little bit more difficult to study, since they appear to work the vast majority of the time. Therefore, there's no definitive single mechanism that is known to be essential for maintaining fetal tolerance. Again, like many questions in biology, the answer to the question of how fetal tolerance is established and maintained is likely a complicated one that consists of numerous redundant mechanisms, which are all engaged throughout the course of pregnancy. Some proposed mechanisms include exclusion of maternal T cells through placental barriers, uh, the expression of enzymes that result in T-cell nutrient depletion at the maternal-fetal interface in the placenta. There's also enrichment of inhibitory Tregs in the placenta. And lastly, um, there's the establishment of a highly immunosuppressive cytokine milieu at this interface that consists of elevated concentrations of both IL-10 as well as TGF-beta. The most likely explanation for how fetal tolerance is sustained throughout pregnancy is that it requires all or at least most of these redundant mechanisms and that these have to act in synergy with each other in order to prevent T cell recruitment and activation at the maternal fetal interface. In summary, today we've learned about how the rejection of transplanted organs is primarily mediated through T cells that recognize or react to mismatches in tissue compatibility or histocompatibility antigens. We've defined allografts as being tissues that are transplanted between genetically distinct individuals, which is the case for essentially every organ transplant. We've learned about the different types of histocompatibility antigens, which are major and minor, and the mechanisms through which T cells mediate both direct and indirect allo recognition. We also briefly covered the hyperacute graft rejection response, which is mediated through allo antibodies. Because T cells play a role in each of these mechanisms, most of the heavy duty immunosuppressive drugs used in transplant recipients center on suppressing effector T cell activation. We also covered two interesting cases of transplantation immunology, which are graft versus host disease, along with the related graft versus leukemia effect, as well as the numerous mechanisms proposed to explain how the adaptive immune system of a pregnant mother remains tolerant of fetal tissue despite histocompatibility antigen mismatch between the two. That's it for week nine of applied immunology. 
Please check the Canvas website or course syllabus for reading assignments that accompany today's lecture. And also remember that you have an extra credit quiz due on Saturday at the end of this week. There's also a discussion prompt centered on summarizing the mechanism of action for anti-allergy or anti-autoimmunity therapies. So please see the week nine discussion board for more details if you're interested in responding this week. Good luck with all of your assignments and see you next week for our last week of lectures in this course.